Hi, welcome to the Potter's Roundtable. This is Pottery Shorts, a series of short pottery topics done on the fly. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Hi, this is Pottery Shorts. I'm Phil Bernberg, and today's topic is annoying glaze ingredients. If you don't make up your own glazes, you probably think that all the ingredients are annoying. But if you do make up your own glazes, you probably found that there are certain glazes that have problems or little sort of peculiarities associated with them. So I thought maybe we'd talk about a few of those today. And I was reminded of this recently because I was making up a cone six glaze that required zinc oxide. And the zinc oxide that we had on hand was kind of granular and it was really hard to disperse. I had to force it through a 30 mesh sieve and then a 60 mesh sieve. And it was really a pain, it was time consuming and it shouldn't be that difficult. And I figured that the, the granular nature of the zinc oxide was actually probably intentional. Because if you remember, most of the raw materials that we use are really intended for large scale industrial consumers. So the properties of these materials are really are tailored to their wants and needs. So it was probably granular, for example, to make it so that when it was poured, it would, be, it would pour more easily rather than if it was a fluffy powder. It would be less dusty when it would be handled in large quantities, in, in, like in an industrial use. And I'm guessing there's a process called spray drying that, they, that a lot of industrial chemicals are prepared by. And I'm, I'm assuming that that's maybe you know, how it was prepared. But the problem, it, problem was it wasn't good for our glaze preparation. Dispersing was really tough. Well, since then, I found a new source for, for zinc oxide, which is a really nice, loose, fluffy powder. And I tested it, and it disperses really easily in water. So that problem is passed, but I've run into that in the past, not just with zinc oxide, with other ingredients being sort of gritty or lumpy and hard to break up. And different, different as, we'll, as we'll see in a minute here, different glaze ingredients can have sort of different associated problems or at least annoyances, let's put it that way. Cornish stone, or also known as corn wall stone, is another ingredient. It's a flux source. It's actually a powdered rock that's imported from England. But the problem was, at least I found in the past, that it was fairly common for it to contain fairly large, up to a quarter an inch or even larger, half inch, hard lumps that were really difficult to break up. They didn't seem to soften in the water and yet you ended up having to sort of mash them through a screen. And again, I think this was probably the result of the drying process. They probably, you know, they mined the rock and then they'd crush it and probably grind it, wet grind it or wet ball mill it. And then they'd have to dry it out and they put it in trays or containers or whatever and dry it and it formed these hard lumps. For better or for worse, it's possible that, from what I understand now, that Cornwall stone, the imported variety, may no, may no longer actually be available. So if you still have some of the older stuff, you may run into this lump problem. But Laguna Clay now is making a synthetic substitute Cornwall stone out of, out of chemicals to sort of achieve the same, um, the same chemical properties. And it's, you can distinguish it because this is sort of a cream-colored powder whereas the Cornwall stone was always a nice clean white powder. I haven't tested the Cornwall, this Cornwall substitute yet in a glaze, but looking at the, at, I've got a sample of it, and looking at it, it does have some small lumps, but they're very soft. So I don't think we're gonna, I think they'll be easy to break up, and I don't think we'll run into the same problem that we did with the original Cornwall stone. Another tricky ingredient sometimes that you may have run, you probably run into this already, is bentonite. And this is a type of clay that's used primarily to help keep the glazes, the wet glazes in suspension. But if it's not well dispersed, it makes these incredibly sticky little lumps that are difficult to eliminate. And one of the things that shows up if you don't break up all the lumps is they show up as, as white spots on the glaze. There'll be a little matte because that, though each, each of these little lumps is only clay. So when the glaze melts and fuses, the, cl the clay doesn't, so you get these matte white spots in the glaze. That's an indication of the, um, the bentonite lumps. The best procedure I found for, the, for, for this is just basically dry mix the powders really well. When you're adding the bentonite powder to the other dry ingredients, mix it really well so that you're spreading out the bentonite and you don't have any lumps of it, because once it starts to form lumps, they're really hard to get rid of. The other thing I suggest is um, try to use about 2% or less of bentonite in a glaze. If you tend to use more, 
One of the problems you can run into is that you, you get excessive drying shrinkage. Because bentonite is such a fine clay, it absorbs a lot of water. And if you have a lot of bentonite in a glaze, it, when it, because it absorbs a lot of water, as the glaze dries, it shrinks a lot. And this can cause cracking in the glaze, and, uh, or one of the things that's more sort of insidious is it can lead to crawling. You may not see these cracks, but the glaze moves on the surface of the drying pot, and then the glaze crawls when it's fired. And it's kind of hard to trace that back to the fact that it might just be an excessively high uh, level of bentonite in the glaze. Some other glaze ingredients um, are also can be very difficult to disperse. And two of them that, that, I'm, that are, one of them is red copper oxide. The formula for that is Cu2O. This is red copper oxide or tin oxide. And the, the, uh, the, the problem may actually be due to the, the actual chemical property. This is tin oxide. This is red copper and this is tin. And the problem may just be sort of the inherent chemical properties of the materials that they don't like to get wet and therefore they don't like to disperse. But in addition to that, it's known that certain chemicals and in particular the red copper oxide, the manufacturers actually intentionally put a water repellent, a hydrophobic coating on the powder. And again, they do this for industrial consumers because the water repellent coating helps to prevent the copper oxide from oxidizing and changing in storage, and it also prevents it at the same time from getting sticky. But the problem is they don't tell you this. This is, they might tell an industrial c consumer who buys, you know, 50 tons of it, but that information de generally doesn't filter down to us buying small retail quantities. And so it's made intentionally water repellent, which means for us it's really difficult to disperse. And again, the answer to this is dry mixing can help. The more you can break up the particles of powder and, and spread them out among the rest of the glaze ingredients, the better. Wet screening will also help break them up. And I found even if you can add a small amount of a non-foaming dish detergent to the glaze, that, to the li liquid glaze, that can actually help. Don't use, the, don't use the squeeze bottle kind that you use in your sink because it makes a lot of foam and bubbles. But if you use the kind, for instance, that, that it goes into an automatic dishwasher where you're not, where you're not trying to produce foam, just a little bit, even a pinch sometimes or a quarter of a teaspoon will help, and it'll help wet, get the powders wet and disperse. Another sort of sometimes or occasionally problematic category of glaze ingredients are fritz. These are glass fritz or these are powdered glasses. And fritz are generally, in most glazes, are used as a flux source. They might be, they might be boron compounds, but they're, they're especially used for low fire and cone six glazes. And the problem is because they're basically powdered glass, they tend to settle out really quickly in the, in the, in the glaze bucket. And at the same time, it's kind of like very fine beach sand. It forms this really hard, dense sludge at the bottom of the bucket. Some people call that hard panning um, when, it, when, it, when it settles out. And again, one of the answers to this is have enough, make sure that there's enough clay in the recipe to help keep it in suspension. You can, and if there isn't, you can add some bentonite to the recipe, but you need something to, keep, to, keep, to help keep this material in suspension. And also, at the same time, keep the glaze flocculated. You may have to check if you've got a glaze that has a lot of fr uh, frit in it, it may be a good idea to sort of check the state of flocculation of the glaze more often than you normally would, because that's what's gonna help keep it in suspension. Once it settles out, it makes this really dense sediment at the bottom. Another glaze ingredient that likes to settle out is rutile. And rutile is a mineral and it's basically, it's titanium oxide plus iron. And it's, it's basically, it's a very popular colorant in glazes. It tends to, it can give a range of colors in a glaze, anywhere from blue to gold. And it also contributes sort of a watery, sort of optical texture to the glaze. It's sort of this watery, wavy sort of appearance to a clear glaze. The problem is it's a very heavy mineral and it tends to settle out very quickly, even a lot faster than the Fritz do. And the problem is, if it settles out and you don't get it stirred up completely in the glaze, then you're going to be changing the appearance of the glaze because you won't be incorporating all the rutile that you're supposed to in the glaze. So again, an answer to this would be, again, make sure that there's enough clay in the glaze to, and, and also flocculate it so that you can keep it in suspension. And the other thing, especially with this one, because it is so heavy, is 
before you use a glaze, make sure you really thoroughly wet mix the glaze. Make sure that if you have some kind of a stirring stick or something, you get all the way down to the bottom of the bucket and scrape it because this, again, this will form a hard, dense layer at the bottom. Make sure you get that up, stirred up and mixed in with the glaze so that you're including it in the, in the glaze that gets on the pot. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Another, another ingredient um, that's, that can cause problems is, you know, you may wonder, like, why do we use any of the ingredients if they all, if they all cause problems? Well, you can't avoid that, you know. You really can't. It's, it's hard to avoid it. We wouldn't have many ingredients left if we only used the ones that, that had no problems associated with them. But nepheline cyanide is another one. This is basically a powdered rock, and it's a common flux source for cone 6 and cone 10 glazes. The problem is it contains a lot of sodium. And sodium, so if you have a glaze with a lot of nepheline cyanide in it, over time, a little bit of the, even though it's a rock, a little bit of the sodium dissolves in the glaze and causes deflocculation. And so it tends to make the glaze, even if you have clay in it, it, it neutralizes the flocculated clay and makes everything just settle out. And again, you end up with a hard sludge or sediment at the bottom. You can't, there's not much you can do about, about to prevent the little bit of sodium from dissolving. But again, it, the answer goes back to the fact that you need to have enough clay in the recipe to help keep it in suspension, and you have to check the flocculation of the glaze periodically to make sure that it is keeping it in suspension. But in this case, the nepheline cyanide is actually counteracting the flocculation of the glaze. It, it will cause, even if you start off with a well-flocculated glaze, it's possible after a week or two that the glaze will start to deflocculate because of the sodium. Another ingredient that we've run into related to nepheline cyanide is G200. This is a kind of potash feldspar. G200, and the issue with this is that in the last, I'm gonna say, I don't know whether it's 10 or 15 years, something like that, the composition has changed. G200, this is a potash feldspar, and it's a very common flux source potash feld, among the potash feldspars, especially for cone 10 glazes. But as I say, the, the composition has changed because they, as they dig deeper in the ground and they, they get to a different part of the deposit, the feldspar is no longer exactly the same composition that it was. So the new material actually has a higher potassium content because it's potash feldspar. And, and because of that, and it also has less silica than custer. It used to be that G200 and, and custer feldspar, they're both potash feldspars, could pretty much be used interchangeably. And now they really can't. So now what they're, they've relabeled, they, can't, they really can't change the composition of what they're getting out of the ground. So now they're calling it G200HP. And the HP stands for high potassium. Okay? So the problem is that in certain glaze recipes, it may no longer be a direct substitute. Because it has higher potassium and less silica, Effectively, it, it increases the coefficient of expansion of the glaze. So you may, st if you try to substitute it in a recipe, some recipes, not all of them, but you may run into, start to see more crazing than you did before. So the, the, the solution to that, fortunately there are solutions to most of these problems. It doesn't get rid of the annoyance factor, but there are solutions to it. So one of the solutions, if you want to substitute it for custard, use the G200HP but also add 3% silica. And that will bring the composition closer to what, to what Custer was if you want to substitute. Or if you want to simulate the old composition, let's say a recipe actually calls for G200, and all we now have is G200HP, to simulate the old composition, use a mixture of 70% of the HP and 30% of a soda feldspar. Because even potash feldspars, when we talk about a feldspar being a potash feldspar or a soda feldspar, it doesn't mean it's all potash or all soda. It means it has more potash than soda 
or more soda than potash. So because the HP has more, more potash, if we add some soda to it, we bring it back more into the balance of the older formulation. Okay? Okay. Another ingredient of this long list of annoying materials is lithium carbonate. This is a really nice concentrated source of lithium. This is a commercially produced chemical. This is not a, uh, this is not a mineral, at least not in the form that we receive it. That's lithium carbonate. I mean, we know there are other, there are other lithium sources like petalite and spodumene and lipidolite. These are other minerals. But lithium, lithium carbonate is a very nice concentrated source of lithium oxide. The problem is it's slightly soluble in water. And as you, as you may recall, in general, we don't want to use water-soluble materials because as the water in the glaze and, the, and on the bisque where it dries, the materials move with the water. And so, we, so they sort of tend to become segregated. And, what, and so one of the problems with the lithium is it can also cause, because it can dissolve a little bit, it can cause deflocculation of the glaze the same way that the sodium did coming out of the nepheline cyanide. The other thing is that it also can produce, a, you may like this, but it can produce a flashed sort of rim around the pot. So if here's a clay surface, and let's say this is just a little, this is a piece of glaze, a little island, maybe it's part of a decoration. Well, when, if, if this is water soluble, what happens is when the glaze dries, the, the, the water moves out into the clay like this and carries some of the lithium carbonate with it. And so you end up with an area around the outside of this glaze that has lithium carbonate in it. Well, that's a flux. And so when the piece is fired, you actually get sort of a little flashed, generally sort of a, ye a yellow or orange rim around the pot. So you no longer have this crisp looking edge to the glaze. Now you may like that effect. It's kind of, it, 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 it literally looks like it's, it's flashing but it, it tends to fuzz the edges of the glaze. Um, and there's not much, there's not really nothing much we can do about that because it is slightly soluble. There isn't really any solution to it. Um, the, if the deflocculation aspect of it, you can counteract with, with flocculating the glaze. Another, another, when we talked about annoying glaze ingredients, there's one that really probably stands out in everybody's mind is Gersley borate. And it's a really useful flux and it aids in suspension and it aids in flocculation. It's a great, it's a great glaze, great glaze ingredient. The problem is it's variable in composition. Ever since it was first mined, they found out because of the nature of the deposit that the, the composition actually varies from lot to lot or scoop to scoop. The other thing is it is actually, it, it contains some ingredient. It's a mixture of stuff. It's kind of like a boron rich dirt. And so one of the things that it contains is actually slightly soluble in water and that, that material can migrate the same way that the lithium did, and so it can produce some strange effects on the edges of glazes, sometimes blisters or pinholes, because this flux is moving out from the edge of the glaze. The other thing is that over the, over the course of time, the availability has varied. Initially, you know, it was very available, then, for, then a number of years ago it was not available at all, and now it's available again, but there still is only a limited supply because this, the mine is not actively being worked, so, Again, it's over the, it's, it has a history of varying in availability. Fortunately, there have been some substitutes that have been developed. Gillespie borate is a synthetic mixture made by the, com the company Hamill and Gillespie. And Laguna Clay Company also has produced a material called Laguna borate, which, which is a substitute. I've seen some tests of some of these substitutes, and to be honest, they don't exactly reproduce all the effects of, of the, Gers, the original Gers, Gersley board. They're close, but they're not exact. There also is even a frit that has about the same composition as Gersley borate, ferro frit number 3134. Um, there may be other frit companies that have a similar substitute. I don't know what the numbers are offhand, but it would be the equivalent composition. Um, but at least there is a substitute available. But you can, but at least Gersley borate is still currently available. So for the time being, you can, you can love it and live with the problems. Um, borax is another, another glaze ingredient. This is, this, is, this is an ingredient that used to be used a lot in glazes because it was a very readily available source of boron, a flux. And I'll just put the formula on the board here, just so we can talk about it a little bit. It's a sodium borate. And there's one, there's one characteristic in particular that I wanted to point out. 
is that. So it's sodium and boron, and it actually contains water in the crystal structure in the same way that clay, kaolinite, contains water in the crystal structure. The problem with this stuff is that when you heat it up, it melts at about the same temperature that the water wants to come off. So when it melts, it bubbles and foams up and produces this sticky foam that rises up above the glaze. And so when you, if you use it in a glaze recipe and you get this foaming up, you have to continue to heat the glaze until the foam collapses and the, and the bubbles and the craters and everything smooth out again. The other problem is it can foam up depending on the amount so much that it actually causes the glaze to slide off the pot. I've seen this in, in old raku glazes where it would literally foam up and form a half inch thick layer of foam on the surface of the pot. And then just because the foam wasn't that stiff, the whole layer of foam would slide down off the pot. It's still listed as a glaze ingredient in a lot of older glaze recipes. People tend to avoid it now because there are, there are a number of other boron sources that we have that are a whole lot better, like the Frit 3134, or Gersley Borey, one of the substitutes, but it, is, it, it shows up still in a lot of old glaze recipes. So it's just something to be aware of because it, will, it, it does cause problems in firing. And lastly, the la I guess the last sort of source of annoyance is the fact that there are a lot of ingredients that are listed in recipes that are no longer available for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're not required by industry anymore and so nobody bothers to mine them. Or maybe better, a better substitute has been found or maybe the mine or the source has actually closed. They've run out of the material. And some examples of this, for example, are King, there's a, there was a common, fairly common potash feldspar called Kingman, K-I-N-G-M-A-N, Kingman feldspar, that's no longer available. Kona, F4 soda feldspar, no longer available. Albany slip, you're probably familiar with that. Colmanite, this was a, a, a boron mineral, very fairly pure boron mineral, and it was a nice, it was a, it was, a, it was a better, more reliable source of boron, for instance, than Gersley borate. Gersley borate contains some colmanite, but a whole lot of other stuff. Well, this was the pure mineral. And finally, there was a, another lithium mineral called lipidolite. You may see this in recipes. That's a lithium mica, and it was a nice source of, it melted fairly low temperatures, it was a nice source of lithium. That's no longer available. So the problem with these ingredients is, first of all, when you see one of these materials listed in a recipe, somehow you have to find out what it is. For instance, Kingman feldspar, you have to realize that that's a potash feldspar. And then you have to try to find a substitute for it, which may or may, there may or may not be a direct substitute um, for it. Okay, well that's all we had for today. I hope you found it useful and thank you for visiting with us. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the presentation, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends. This way we get more viewers of our, of our videos. Also check out our website, www.hfclay.com. We'd really like to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts such as these videos. And if you'd like to consider becoming a patron, go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.